All right, I think we're pretty much at time here, so we're going to start pretty much on time uh, here. My name is Tim Merritt, and I teach at Faith Lutheran School in Plano, Texas. I've been there 18 years, something like that, so I've been there a little while. Uh, was um, <coughs> instrumental in getting our high school started, and uh, I primarily teach in high school now, and uh, I teach theology, history, history, and literature as a cohesive. So we study a period of history, and then we study what was going on. Uh, in the scriptures and in other, uh, you know, historical things and read the literature from that period at the same time and so forth. Uh, I have to apologize that the name of my my presentation got changed somehow when it got put into the program itself. Uh, this is not primarily on, uh, quote, good uh, curriculum. When I saw that that's what was in it, I added a little bit to it so that we can talk about that a little bit. Some of the principles that go with good literature, uh, selecting good literature, also apply to good curriculum. Um, in there, this is going to be uh, a little different than um, uh, past, or, uh, Dr. Beat's uh, take on it because he's looking at structure and different things like that um, in there, but that's, that's what this presentation is on. So um, we're going to be talking about what makes literature good and then looking at some uh, examples from some of the books that we teach and why I consider them to be valuable and some of the lessons that we hope students to get out of it. All right, so uh, basically it's going to be divided into two parts, as I mentioned. We're going to talk about what is good literature and then we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at examples of good literature uh, and um, lessons that you can get out of them. So, what is good literature? Well, first of all, I think that good literature literature should challenge the reader to think about questions and issues such as these. The issue of God. If you uh, look at history as a whole and societies as a whole, the vast majority of people that have ever lived believe in some sort of higher being. Uh, it's actually a small minority, maybe a lot of people in the United States today, but it's actually a small minority that believe that we just proved ourselves here and didn't exist. Uh, or didn't uh, have uh, a God involved. Uh, so questions like, does God exist? And if he does, what sort of God is he? Is he a personal God that actually interacts with us, or is he a God that started everything and then sits back to see what happens? Uh, what kind of a God is he? Does he require anything from me? If he does, how can I appease to have a right relationship with God? So good literature will explore some of these types of themes. Obviously, when you're looking at some of the ancient literature, they believed in a group of gods, polytheistic, um, but they still ask these same type, types of questions. Questions about life, such as why are we here, how did we get here, and is there any purpose or reason for being here? Is the whole purpose for being here nothing more than to put food in your body and keep it alive until death takes you? Or is there some other reason for being here? How did you get here? What is the purpose for it? And then, of course, at the end of uh, life comes death. And so questions about what happens after death. Is there an afterlife? And if there is, what is this afterlife like? Do our actions here in this life affect our afterlife? and questions about legacy, such as how do I want to be remembered after death? Uh, good books ask these types of questions. Other questions. Um, questions about happiness. What is happiness, and can you attain it? Um, if you, some books believe that you can attain happiness, and they will suggest various different ways, and others will basically uh, indicate that you can't really get happiness in this world. And of course, as Christians, we have a different view of what happiness is, and we would talk usually using the term joy more so than happiness. Uh, but uh, we would certainly want to explore those themes as we read those books as well. And questions of morality, values, or virtue. You've heard those terms used a lot at this conference, virtue in particular. Uh, these books explore questions about are these real things or are these merely human inventions? Um, a lot of what you're going to hear in the public sector nowadays is that these are human inventions. And so therefore, if you don't agree with them, you just make up your own rules. All right? Uh, and then questions like, why should I care about or help uh, others? Why should I care about others or help them? So those are some of the types of questions that good literature asks. I also think that good literature will challenge readers to think about themselves. And I don't mean self-centered. I mean think about themselves in these ways. What kind of person am I really? All right, so to learn more about themselves, it should teach you something about yourself. 
When you read books that show failings in other characters, you should be able to see if you share that failing with them or to identify other failings about yourself. You should also be able to identify um, strengths and so forth as well. They also ask questions like, what kind of person do I want to be? All right, sometimes you see somebody in the story who has a weakness that you also have and you relate to them in that way. Other times you see somebody that you aspire to be like. What are my strengths and weaknesses? Uh, also, uh, good literature should help to uh, show you strengths and weaknesses in general and then you should be able to apply them to yourself. It also asks questions like, how ought I to behave toward others? So I think that's another uh, question that a lot of stories deal with that relationship between people and how you ought to act toward one another and what types of things happen if you don't. And then again, uh, tying into that legacy question from the other section about uh, how do you want to be remembered after death. Um, good literature also oftentimes talks about those types of things. And of course, the pagans had a different view of why you wanted to be remembered after uh, death and so on and so forth. But it still is a good thing that comes in a lot of literature. I think it also gives readers a chance to see law, uh, law and gospel at work in the world. Now, obviously, um, I know the audience that I'm speaking to, so I'm assuming that you all know you have to teach the scriptures. That's the most important thing, and it will cover all of these questions and all of these lessons and so forth. So I'm not primarily going to talk about these uh, examples from the scriptures. The scriptures is full of them, and you obviously will want to do that. Uh, I think that also teaching these other pieces of literature helps to reinforce the fact that, uh, first of all, it should be pretty obvious that people in their heart know something is wrong with the world. All right, and they also, uh, from the fact that they try to justify actions and different things like that, they obviously feel the law pressing upon them. So you can see the law a lot in other literature. Gospel, we'll talk about in just a minute how you can see glimpses of it in places, but you can't see the pure gospel except in the scriptures, obviously. It has to be revealed. All right, so questions like, why did God give the law, and why is it good? Most Americans today uh, would think that God's law is put there to stop you from having fun and doing what you want to do, and, you know, um, God wants to keep something good from you. Uh, it's back to uh, the temptation in the garden, you know, making it sound like, you know, there's something good that God doesn't want you to have, and that's why he doesn't want you to eat from the street, that type of deal. And, uh, and so showing why it is good um, in this world, how you will have a, an easier time if you do what you ought to as opposed to what you ought not to do. It also, uh, good literature will repeatedly show the consequences of breaking God's law. Uh, the scripture, of course, is, is an excellent place for this as well. Um, we talk a lot in high school about how uh, you have to <coughs> use the, the gifts that God has given you and pray before you make major decisions because some decisions have short-term, little, small consequences and some decisions have massive consequences. Uh, and the Bible is a great place for showing the, the difference between some of those. Uh, some have short-term, you know, uh, consequences that go with them, and then some of them like, hey, why don't you take my maid servant and sleep with her and have a son through her, have long-term consequences like happened, uh, you know, with Haggai and, and Abraham and Sarah. And obviously that started a whole big, long years of consequences that went along with that. So looking at those consequences. Uh, answering questions like, why am I unable to follow God's law? As you will see people that in many of these stories, um, Dr. V talked this morning about how there's flat characters and rounded characters, and rounded characters, you will see people who have good intentions, and yet they still cannot carry through on their good intentions. They have flaws that prevent them from doing that. And if you study, uh, if you study the ancient understanding of what tragedy and comedy was, uh, tragedy has to do with people who have what normally would be a good characteristic, but it leads them to a bad decision. And it causes their downfall because they either have too much of it or they use it inappropriately. And that's why it's a tragedy because they weren't necessarily bad people. It's not a tragedy when bad people have bad stuff happen to them. It was a tragedy to them when people who were trying to do the right thing had bad things happen. And it, you will see this appear over and over again. Uh, since we then will 
have the law thrown at us and we can see that we're unable to fulfill God's law, it would cause you to ask questions like, how then can I be declared righteous and justified? Uh, and of course, you have to go to the scriptures for the answer to that. Now, here's another one where the gospel does pop up in little snippets in different places in literature and also in movies and so on and so forth. Uh, it's amazing as you look at literature and storytelling and so forth, how many savior themes there are. And uh, story after story where uh, it wasn't people working together that can save them and get them out of the struggle. It's just one person that can come and do it. And how many times does that one person have to die in order to save everyone? A lot. You see those types of themes that pop up in there. And why is it in there a lot? And one of the things that I talk about with my students is it's in there a lot because people look around and first of all, they realize the world is not the way it's supposed to be. There's something wrong here. Second of all, they realize they can't fix it. So then they turn to somebody hopefully can come and fix this. All right, so if they're already feeling that need, that should, in theory, leave an opening for the gospel message. All right, we'll talk about some examples now. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the sometimes called dy uh, dystopian um, stories that go in here. Uh, we do a number of these. Um, we do 1984 and Animal Farm and Communist Manifesto every uh, series. And the Brave New World and Fahrenheit uh, 451 are ones that we sometimes do for summer readings. It's additional things that go with that. Uh, one of the questions that I think people fail to, to ask when they are uh, doing these uh, dystopian type novels with students, I think a lot of times they study why it failed, how it went wrong, those type of things, but they never ask the question, why have so many people throughout history tried to create these utopias? And again, it goes back to the idea of people recognize there's something wrong in the world, that it's not the way it should be, and they want to try to fix it. Uh, so that's why there's so many of those. Now, why do they all fail? We have an answer to that, obviously. Uh, we know that, uh, and I cannot remember which of the, the uh, authors that we study this quote is from, but he talks about how, uh, he says, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. Uh, but we're not, we're jerks, and so we have to make rules. That's basically what he says. And not only rules, but then an enforcer to come and enforce the rules. And so why did the attempts fail? Because we're sinful. So when you set up like in Communist Manifesto where he says, the root of all human struggle in all of history is property ownership, basically. If you take that away and everything's owned jointly, everyone will be happy because it will be equal. But people don't want to be equal. They want to be better than their neighbor. That's our sinful nature. And so that's why these, these things fail. What, uh, does this mean then that we should just give up and not try to improve society and only focus on the next life? Uh, obviously, we know that our purpose here on earth is not to turn the world into a heaven on earth. That certainly is not the purpose here. Our, uh, we are to, of course, preach the good news. But as we live out vocation, the Lutheran understanding of that, you will affect the world around you just by doing what you are set here to do. So as you live out your life in your various locations, you will have an impact on the society around you. Sometimes it will be a small little impact like dropping a pebble in. Sometimes maybe it will be a bigger splash. But uh, the Lutheran concept of vocation fits into this idea that, yes, we should uh, we should live out our vocations, and in doing so, the world around us, we should serve our neighbor and therefore make it a little bit nicer. But we're not going to make a perfect life on earth. That's not the purpose of uh, the Christian life. All right, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, I don't know how many of you are necessarily familiar with this, um, this story, but... Uh, it's one of the oldest pieces of literature um, that actually was written down, one of the oldest written ones that are, that is down there. And uh, in this story, you've got Gilgamesh is super strong, like Samson type strong. And he cannot be stopped by anyone, and he decides to be a selfish brat, basically. And um, so he decides what he's going to do. He's the king of the city. And so he decides that as king, he should be able to do whatever he wants. And what he wants is to attend every wedding in the city, follow them to the bridal chamber, to the, the wedding chamber, knock the guy down, and take his wife. 
That's what he wants to do. And so, of course, you can imagine the guys and the women in the city were not too happy with this. So they call out to their gods and say, send someone to contend with him and to restrain him because we can't do anything. He's too strong. And so they send Enkidu. And Enkidu comes and wrestles with him at the doorway of one of the bridal chambers and stops him from doing that. And they wrestle basically to a stalemate. And then he says, all right, I'll stop because you said to stop. What are we going to do now? And Enkidu says, why don't we go out and do some missions? Make a name for ourselves. And the missions that they do, unfortunately, uh, happen to involve uh, killing the, the great bull from heaven and things belonging to the gods. And so the gods were not too happy about this. And they said, one of them must die. And Enkidu is the one that they choose to die. And that's the first time that it occurs to Gilgamesh that he's as strong as I am, and he just died. Must Gilgamesh be like Enkidu, he asks? Must he be consumed by the maggots? Because he sits there for a long time watching the body as it decays. And he realizes for the first time that he's going to die. And so he wants to find out if there's any way to avoid this. Well, he hears this story about this guy who survived a worldwide flood, and the gods have said he can live forever, and if you go talk to him, he might be able to tell you how to do this. So he goes to visit this guy. Of course, you know, there's, there's flood narratives in many different cultures, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and he goes to this guy, and the guy tells him various missions that he can try to do, and he fails at all of the missions, and so then he just sits down and weeps and realizes he's never going, he's going to die. There's nothing he can do about it. He's not going to be eternal. So then he starts asking questions about, is there a way that I could live beyond my death? I could live in memory. Right now, the memory is going to be of the jerk that took people's lives, but I don't have to make that my legacy. And he goes back and becomes a good king where he does all for his people and tries to build a better city and tries to make a name for himself in that, in that uh, way. Um, and so you can talk about things like how uh, we're all going to die, uh, issues of mortality and so on and so forth. You can talk about uh, what man's place and role is. Are we here to serve ourselves or are we here to serve God and others? Um, and those types of things you can talk about in Gilgamesh. Uh, also for fulfillment and happiness, which of course mean different things to the non-Christian than they do to the Christian. Uh, but you could talk about those, those things as well. We also do uh, three of the so-called monster novels, if you want to call them, call them that. Uh, yeah, I could talk about each of these books for hours on end, but uh, I'm going to talk about one key thing from each of these books. So Frankenstein first. If you've never read Frankenstein, you may have this idea that Frankenstein was a monster from the start, always was a monster, so on and so forth. It's an extremely sad story because he starts out, he's hideous in appearance, but he actually wants human companionship. He tries to do kind things to people, and every time they see him, they're like, oh, a monster, and they get the pitchforks out uh, type of deal. When Frankenstein creates him, when he first comes to life, he looks at him, uh, screams at his hideous movement and appearance and runs off and leaves him. So he waits for his creator to come back and he doesn't and so he finally stumbles out into the street and people scream and push him out of town and he goes off and lives uh, in the woods and he finds a family that's there that <coughs> needs some help. And so at night he goes and chops wood for them and sets stuff out and he tries to build a relationship and he thinks it's finally time to show himself. And of course they scream and freak out on him destroyed. So then he goes back to Frankenstein to ask for help. He shuns him. That's when he turns into a monster. All right. Loving the unlovable. How lovable are we when you consider the hideousness of sin? But God didn't abandon us. All right. Uh, sometimes you have to you have to look beyond that and not you, you can't let just appearances and things like that uh, affect our our uh, duty to love our neighbor. You can't allow appearances. You can't allow how they act toward you to affect it. We are to love the neighbor. So that's a, that's a good thing from there. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, Dr. Jekyll claims what he's trying to do is extract 
all of the goodness out of a person and have the good person and then the bad stuff left over. But what he does is extract all of the evil out, and that's where Mr. Hyde comes out. And he, uh, at first, is a little bit concerned about what he's done, but then he realizes, you know, if you take all of the good out, you don't even feel guilty anymore. And it's kind of fun to go out and do these things and not even feel bad about it. And he starts to like it a little. By the time he decides, wow, that's really messed up, it's too late and he can't reverse the effects. And now he's making the change without taking the potion. And so it talks about, you know, the, the danger of uh, purging guilt and values out of your yourself or modern day America out of society. Where shame anymore? You know, when the scripture talks about the things that they do in private, it's shameful to even discuss them. And we're not just discussing them, we're throwing it on the screen in front of everyone. Shame is gone, guilt is gone. So the dangers of those things. Uh, Dracula. Um, this is not Twilight if you've never read Dracula. Uh, there is nothing good about the character of Dracula. He is bad through and through. He's not a good guy um, in there. And so you look at when you face this super strong creature that's lived for you know hundreds of years uh, that is pure evil, how can you defeat it? Well, they, they use faith, courage, friendship, working together, those types of things to be able to do that. Uh, and to see that uh, they, uh, now it's a, a Catholic type background more so than a Lutheran type background of their faith and so forth because they're using relics and symbols and different things like that uh, to help uh, fight against him. Uh, but it still is faith that they are uh, relying upon and that they would have collapsed without that, uh, particularly uh, Van Helsing um, is, a, is a faith based person in there. So um, that's a lesson that you can get out of that. All right, Pilgrim's Progress, Little Women, and Confessions. Um, I put these ones together because they cover a couple of things that uh, I think kind of go together. So let me just put these up here and then we'll kind of talk about this a little bit in there. Uh, if you've never read um, these books, these are all excellent books as well. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, walking the Pilgrim's Path, and along the way he's going to stumble repeatedly. And, uh, for example, he's got the part where he's, uh, he's captured by the giant despair and put in the dungeon, and he's down there just despairing, woe is me, for quite some time, until suddenly he goes, hold it, they gave me a key. And he reaches in his pocket, and sure enough, the key's still there, and it's the key to the cell. All right, and that happens to us all the time. We forget that we have a means to conquer these things. And we just don't use it sometimes. We forget about it because we're in despair. Uh, and so um, Pilgrim's Progress is also really good because you can do, you could read this story to your younger children and they can pretty much figure out from the characters' names what they are. All right, Faithful is the name of one of the characters. You can pretty much figure out what he's going to be. Uh, or if you've got one called Vain Glory, uh, you can pretty much figure out what they're about. By the names of the characters, they, you can pretty much figure out uh, whether they're going to be good or bad. Uh, so in these stories, and then uh, Little Women, um, I, it's a, I really like Little Women. Um, Little Women does not truly make sense to you if you haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, because when they're talking about trying to walk the Pilgrim's Path, if you don't know what the Pilgrim's Path is, it's not going to make complete sense to you. Uh, but that's a really good one as well, and then St. Augustine Confessions. Uh, so recognizing that we have weaknesses, confessing our sins, um, seeing that we receive forgiveness and that it's going to be a lifelong struggle with sin. That's just the way that it is. Dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Dead to sin doesn't mean you stop sinning. It means that you adopt the attitude towards sin that God has. You hate it. You despise it. As St. Paul writes, uh, the good that I would, I don't do, but the very thing I hate, this I keep doing. What wretched man am I? And who can deliver me from this body of death? And of course, praise be to God through praise be. So, uh, excellent, um, excellent book for teaching those things as well. Uh, if you haven't read Confessions before, in there he goes through the sins of his youth in quite some detail, and even talks about how um, he used to sin deliberately because it was a sin, not because he got any pleasure other than the sin. So, for example, he would steal pears that he didn't like, he had no intention of eating, 
just because it was stealing. And it was fun to do something bad. So he would steal them and then throw them to the pigs. Uh, it's also really good in that one because uh, um, if there's any question about if people used to believe in original sin in children, read, read his discussion about uh, uh, whether or not kids in the nursery sin or not. Uh, it's pretty interesting, pretty interesting stuff when it goes in there. And he says, uh, put ten kids in a nursery together. And the one cries and everyone else is quiet until they go over and they're getting attention. And then the others, they're not hungry, they don't need to be changed, but they see the attention being given, and they want the attention. Well, that's selfish. It doesn't matter if it's deliberate and understood or whatever else. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting the way that he talks about it. So it's a good one. All right, Beowulf, Robin Hood, uh, Theseus, The Song of Roland, Lord of the Rings, Chronicles of Narnia. There's lots of others that have these types of themes in them as well. Um, so servant leadership. Uh, in a lot of these types of things, although the person is powerful, although they are strong, they use their strength for good to help others out that are, that are not able to defend themselves and to defend them from uh, the wicked or the evil. Uh, they're servant leaders in the sense that uh, they do not lead for the purpose of everyone serving them and giving them what they want. They lead because the people need a leader and they are helping the people get what they need. All right, so you see a lot of those types of things in these, uh, in these stories. Um, in Beowulf, uh, he goes partly to repay a debt to, uh, to the king uh, for something that he did for his father beforehand, but he mostly goes to, to battle uh, the, the monster because he's the one that can do it. And he knows that nobody else can, so he goes and does that. Um, I think a better example of servant leadership from Beowulf is at the end of his life. He's old, he's uh, ruled for something like seven years of peace, and the dragon comes. And instead of sitting there like Denethor from the Lord of the Rings and using his own sons and sending them out against the evil, he goes out to battle. And you could throw in King Arthur and some of the other stories like that, or there's, there's instances of them doing that as well. And he goes out knowing full well that he's probably going to die in the attempt. But he goes out anyway, he does defeat it, he does die too. But he goes out and does it because he's the one that can do it. And he does it for his people so that they will have peace still. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, um, for those of you that, that don't know me, um, after the Bible, that's the best book ever. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I do a massive unit on the Lord of the Rings. There's so many lessons you can get out of that. Sam Wise is my favorite character from that one. I like Sam because Sam is a servant and he's happy about it. He likes being a servant. He doesn't say, oh man, that stinks, I've got to do something for Frodo. I wish people would serve me and do things for me. As a matter of fact, when they try to sit him at the table, it makes him really uncomfortable. Can't I get up and go serve? I don't want to sit here and be served. All right, he's a servant and he likes to do it. He takes things, uh, when they're first leaving, he packs away things that Frodo has forgotten so that he can bring them out in triumph when Frodo calls for them later. That's what he wants to do and wants to be in. So I think he's a great character. Uh, in that. Uh, obviously there's a lot of sacrifice that you'll see in that uh, in that book as well. Um, loyalty and friendship are replete through these books as well. Uh, in the Song of Roland you see the strong contrast between the faithful ones and the ones that are liars and betraying uh, that go over to the side of the Saracens and betray in order to get Roland killed and so forth. Um, and so uh, you'll see a lot of those types of things. Obviously, courage in the face of adversity is in all of these as well. So these are excellent themes that you can get from those types of books. <coughs> okay, last two books then. Um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was um, not a good guy as far as Christians are concerned. He was a persecutor of the Christians. Uh, and so forth, but there are some things that in meditations, uh, I'm amazed that a pagan could have figured out um, and come up with, and so I think there's some good, good lessons that you can learn from meditations as well on duty and a man's uh, purpose for being and a man's job. So I'm going to read you a paragraph from book five of meditations. Uh, this paragraph is probably one of my two or three favorite from meditations. 
the reason that this particular one is one of my favorites is partly because uh, I'm not a morning person. I hate mornings. I uh, always have my whole life. I can stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning and be perfectly functional and getting all kinds of work done, but I do not like to get up in the morning. So it begins with the words. In the morning when thou risest unwillingly, let this thought be present. I am rising to the work of a human being. Why then am I dissatisfied if I am going to do the things for which I exist and for which I was brought into this world? Or have I been made for this, to lie in the bedclothes and keep myself warm? Ah, but you say, this is more pleasant. Dost thou exist then to take thy pleasure and not for action, any action or exertion? Dost thou not see the little plants, the little birds, the ants, the spiders, and the bees? working together to put in order their several parts of the universe. And art thou unwilling to do the work of a human being? Dost thou not make haste to do that which is according to thy nature? Ah, you say, but it is necessary to take rest also. It is necessary. However, nature hath fixed bond, bounds to this as well. She has fixed bonds both to eating and drinking. And yet thou goest beyond the, these bounds, beyond what is sufficient. Yet in thy acts, it is not so, but rather thou stoppest short of what thou canst do. So thou lovest not thyself, for if thou didst, thou wouldst love thy nature and her will. But though those who love their se several acts exert themselves and exhaust themselves in working at them, unwashed and without food, but thou valuest thy own nature less than the tuner, turner values the turning art, or the dancer the dancing art, or the lover of money values his money, or the vainglorious man his little glory. Such men, when they have a violent affection to a thing, will choose neither to eat nor to sleep, rather than to perfect the things for which they care for. But the acts which concern society, are these more vile in thy, thine eyes and less worthy of thy labor? So he's talking about man's purpose and uh, job in, in the world and saying, don't be lazy, get up and do what you were put here to do. Now, in another book, he talks about what we were put here to do. And what he says that we were put here to do is to cooperate with each other and to improve things for your neighbor. How did he figure that out as a pagan? It's pretty amazing that he could have figured some of these types of things out. Uh, but he even uses the illustration and says, um, you will, each morning, you should say to yourself, today I'm going to run into a lot of jerks. And he goes through a list of people that you're going to run into. And he says, but... You should not be angry with these people. Instead, you should instruct and help them to overcome whatever it is that's causing them to act in that way. Why? Because we are like parts of a body made for cooperation. Sound somewhat familiar? It's interesting that, that a pagan could have figured out some of these things. And it's, uh, it's sad, obviously, that he was not a believer. He also talks a lot about self-control self because he was a, uh, uh, what's the philosophy that uh, doesn't, Stoic? not a, yeah, uh, the Stoic, yeah, not a Pecurian. So he was a Stoic, so of course he was one of those people that basically believed if you're having fun, knock it off. All right, just stop. So yeah, death, obviously self-control went along with that. Um, the first book, by the way, he goes through and he makes a list of all the people that he is grateful for giving him something for life. Beginning with his parents and he goes through all these other people and lists them. Guess what the first assignment that I made the students do with me is that. They have to make a list of all the people that they're thankful to uh, for that. And I told them, I hope they all did, I told them to hold on to that and open it again in about 10 years and then again in 20 years and see how many more things you'll have to add to it by then. Because you'll realize all the things your parents gave you that you're not realizing yet. And you'll see all these other things. Uh, my favorite is his, uh, I think Rusticus is the name, but he says, from him he received the impression that his character required work, uh, required some correction and improvement. So uh, I always got a kick out of that one, uh, went along with that. Um, he also talks a lot about contentment because he says it doesn't do any good to whine and complain. Whining and complaining doesn't fix the problem. Instead, accept the fact that that's the way it is right now and do what you can to improve it. All right, last book I want to talk about then is uh, Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. 
All right, uh, one of the things that is really, um, was kind of eye-opening to me because pre previous to reading that I'd never really heard uh, the difference between virtue and vice explained in this way. Basically, the way that he explains it is virtue is the mean or the center. Vice is either a deficiency in a virtue or an excess of a virtue. So, for example, take courage. A deficiency we call cowardice. Can you have too much courage? Yeah, you can do stupid stuff, right? Because you're not afraid. But you should have been afraid. That was a good time to be afraid. Because you're doing stupid stuff just for the sake of doing it to show you're brave. All right, so that's called rashness. And so that would also be considered a vice. Um, you talk about uh, temperance, which is really the right amount of everything. A lot of people think temperance is you refrain from everything. And that's not really what temperance is about uh, in, the, in the classical understanding of that. Temperance is staying in the mean, in the right spot. Uh, and if you've ever read any of C.S. Lewis's works, he talks about, for example, some people will say uh, temperance, um, talk about uh, sexuality, for example. They would say, well, that means none ever. You know, you should, you should become a monk or a nun and so on and so forth. Uh, and he says, you know, that's absolutely wrong. If you are a married person, there is a time to exercise your sexuality, an appropriate time and place to do it. All right? And there's also time to refrain from it. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of staying in the middle. That's uh, what uh, virtue is. He also talks about the difference between intellectual and moral virtue. We spent a lot of discussion in the conference overall, uh, and even when we're eating dinner and lunch and so forth, a lot of the discussion that we've been at the tables is whether or not you can actually teach virtue. And he says there are certain virtues that are intellectual virtues that you can teach, uh, and these would be like mathematical virtues. He, he has a list of virtues that are, uh, we would say, more like subjects almost, or like uh, we would say tools or, or those types of things rather than virtues. Um, but moral virtue, he said, is not something that you can learn in a classroom. Moral virtue is a habit of the soul. And you develop the habit by practice. In the same way that an archer becomes good at archery by practicing shooting arrows correctly, if you wish to be courageous, you practice doing courageous acts. You start out small with what you can handle until it becomes a habit where you no longer even think about it. That's, that's his uh, feelings on that. So uh, moral virtue requires practice and discipline. If you want to get good at it, you've got to practice it. You start out in small quantities when you're very young, and then you develop those, uh, those qualities in yourself until it becomes full-fledged. Now, for him to be full-fledged truly a virtue, you have to, first of all, recognize that what you are doing is the right thing. You can't do it accidentally, or it's not a virtue. You have to make an active choice to do it. And thirdly, you have to do it because it was right. Not because somebody's going to pat you on the back, not because you're going to get a good business deal out of it, but you do it for the sake of it being right. So you have to recognize it is right, deliberately choose it, and choose it only for the sake of rightness. Uh, that's what he says. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether or not you can actually, uh, you can actually teach that or not. You can habituate somebody to act in a certain way. Uh, we, we know that you can condition people to act in certain ways and so forth. I'm not sure if that's true virtue, if it's not something that you're, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, that's, that's gone on quite a bit in uh, this particular thing. Um, all right, so a couple of final thoughts here. Uh, first of all, I mentioned before that obviously you want to start with the Bible. That's the most important book to teach, and we'll cover all the topics in there. The other thing that I want to um, throw out to everyone, and I'm sure everyone at this conference is good at this as well, uh, we also have a huge, valuable tool that other denominations, many of them do not have. Teach the hymns. The hymns are excellent for doing this as well. Uh, the music touches people in a different way than just words do. Uh, and so when you, when you put the two together, it makes it really easy for them to learn some of these things. Students just really pick these things up great. Um, and do that. I use the hymns all the time. Uh, our, our, uh, we're a singing congregation. That's one of the things faith is really known for. If you're ever in uh, Plano uh, on a Wednesday, swing by and see our chapel service. Uh, it's amazing to hear these kids sing. It really is. 
Um, it's funny because even when they come in and the organ's playing the prelude music, they can't help themselves. They just start singing it or humming the tune or whatever else with it. They just, it's so ingrained into them. And so I can use these things with the high school students all the time uh, when we start talking about these different things. Uh, you know, when we start talking about uh, why, why do good works then? It's not for works righteousness, obviously. We know uh, that uh, Christ's work is sufficient for us. So why do we want to do them as well? Well, works serve our neighbor and supply the proof that faith is living, right? Uh, it's, it's in the hymns as well as in the scriptures that you can talk about those different things. They, it's an outward act uh, in response to what we've been given to love our neighbor. All right, so uh, you want to you make sure you do that. I think that these other books can help show how God's word is true because you see that what he said is going to happen if you do these things, you're not going to have a good ending. And then we can see in most of these books, people that do the evil things have bad things happen to them, right? Uh, that goes along with that. And it also is interesting that you see how deep down people do know God's law. They try to act like they don't. They try to act like, uh, no, that's just some convention made up by people and it's not true. And one of the most common phrases you hear in the United States today is, religion is the cause of all uh, you know, wars and killing that the world has ever known. That's what they'll sit there and say. If you just get rid of that, uh, everything will be cool. Yeah, every single person that robs a liquor store does it for a religious reason. I'm sure that will solve all the problems with the religion. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, obviously, but those are the types of things that people will say. Uh, it's also interesting because when people start trying to defend their action, how many times do you defend a right action? You don't even feel the need to try to defend the right action. As soon as you start trying to defend it, it's probably a pretty good indication that you knew you weren't supposed to be doing it. Nobody says, now, I'm going to help this poor person over here, but let me explain why. I, I want to make sure you understand my reason why I'm going to do it. All right. So as soon as you start justifying, it shows that you know God's law. A um, little bit of contact information for me. I'm at Faith Plano, uh, and you can reach me at tmerit at flsplano.org if you have any uh, additional questions. Now, applying this to curriculum in general, in general, when you're looking for curriculum, you would also want to uh, look for uh, curriculum that is going to not counteract what we're trying to teach them from the scriptures, obviously. You would, um, what we really need is for all the people that are in CCLE and uh, Lutheran uh, education and higher institution across the country to get together and write a curriculum and put it together so that we can publish one so that we quit having to use other people's. Uh, the other thing that we can do is a lot of us that have been doing this for a while, if we share what we're doing back and forth, I think that can help an awful lot as well. Because right now what we're faced with is if you want to buy something, you pretty much have to buy something that somebody outside of the Lutheran uh, church has adopted. That's pretty much what you're facing a lot of times. Um, if you do that, you have to really be aware of what pitfalls are and what the issues are. Uh, for example, we have used some of the materials from Veritas because when we first got started, that's who was doing it, and that's who had the information. Um, you have to really know it well, though, because they use some of the same terms that we use, but they mean something completely different. We occasionally use the term sovereignty of God, but we don't mean what they mean by sovereignty of God. So you have to be really careful using their materials uh, when, you, when you do those types of things. They also believe, and they will say this over and over again uh, in their materials, they believe that we are to conquer the world for Christ. And they don't mean by the gospel. They mean literally subdue the world into a Christian utopia. That that is part of what our job is to do here. Uh, and so you have to be careful about that kind of stuff if you use materials from there. Um, you can use materials from other places, but you have to be aware of the pitfalls and make sure that you change the program. Yes? Um, so I'm sort of sharing and uh, coaching good ideas from other schools. Um, something that we have tried to do with a lot of our curriculum in general is to you know come up with, like you said, we. We started out by, by purchasing curriculum, but we know that no curriculum that is made, not even something the school produces, can be a panacea to mm -hmm. you know, fix everything. Um, and so, in addition to you know writing new curriculums and, and using different resources and kind of building our repertoire for each one, we also try to kind of 
write a philosophy, what is the Lutheran, what is, you know, right. manuals, philosophy of history. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Do you as a planner have a document that explains to parents, you know, for example, why reading pagan literature is okay, why not just reading Christian Becker books, um, and morality narratives is okay, do you, do, do you give that, do you have support the research for parents at all, where you go down and break down your literature philosophy? Um, we do have for uh, our our philosophy in general, not specifically just with um, just with uh, literature, but yes, we do have a, a thing that goes through and explains what we're attempting to do and what uh, what the different components of uh, education are and uh, why we're doing the various things that we're doing. So yeah, we've got a document like that uh, that's in there. Uh, I think it's in the. Parent Handbook, I think, is where it's it's like one of the opening deals with that. It kind of follows after our um, mission statement, um, and then it kind of goes into how we're trying to execute that within the school. Um, as an added resource for the community, have you ever written anything or spoken about? Um, I mean, modern children's literature is, is really is really awful. Mm -hmm. I think that parents <laughs> even realize this, and I mean, um, often parents will come to me and say. What, what do I read or how do I insert, you know, and a lot of these kids are reading, you know, the, the ideal is that the parents are reading the book first and figuring out if it's an appropriate book and it has appropriate parts. See, and that, that, was a, that was a rule in our family. They could not read a series that I had not read. Um, that was just a, a family rule that we have. And so, you know, I, I read various ones that they wanted to try to read. And uh, sometimes I said yes after I read, <laughs> read it. Sometimes I said no. Um, that went along with that, but uh, yes, I have talked about that quite a bit. You know, some, in one of the the last session I did, they were asking somebody asked uh, the modern version of the dystopias. Do we talk about those or do any of those? Uh, we we do not. I read Divergent some of the others simply because I knew students were reading them, and so I like to know what my students are reading uh, in there. Uh, I have an. We don't have enough time, enough time to go into all the issues that I have with them. Uh, let's just start with from a point of, uh, of literary excellence. They're not literary excellence. Um, the difference between a flat character and a round character. I think that their characters are way too flat. And, and for me to get into a, I like fantasy obviously since I'm a Tolkien fan. For me to get into fiction, I have to care about the character. And I can't care about a character that's flat. I just can't. And so if I sit there and go, I, I can't keep reading this. I don't even care what happens to these people. Right. And that's what I see in a lot of these books. I just think the characters are very flat. I don't think they're real. They're just not. A lot of the children's, so-called children's teen literature, they aren't just flat. They're awful people. Mm -hmm. You know, just the, the characters themselves, it's like you're almost rooting for them to get killed. Right. You know, wish that it, it happened earlier. Or you have, and you see this in the movies nowadays as well, too, what they're calling the anti-hero. Right. Uh, you're seeing those, those type of things with that. And that is not what we want our kids to aim for. We know that they can't be perfect. We know that. Uh, that's not what we're, we're trying to shoot for. But you shouldn't aspire to be happy with your deficiency. Which is what these heroes are. These, these anti-heroes are basically, they're perfectly content with the fact that they're an all-around jerk because they occasionally do some heroic things. And they're perfectly content with it. Yeah. Or you think about some of the, the uh, movies that have come out as, as well. Um, you know, Iron Man is not a very nice guy. He's an all-around jerk. But because he does a few heroic things, now we think we've got to cut him some slack. House. 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 Yes. House. Yeah, another, that's another excellent example. But there's lots of these type of things in there, um, which is why we don't do a lot of the, the more modern type literature in there uh, for two reasons. First of all, um, I don't think most of it's very good. And second of all, it hasn't stood the test of time yet. Uh, and so we're, there's a finite number of things that we can read. Uh, the kids in our high school um, read the entire Bible and about 120 other books over four years. So it's, it's pretty intense, a lot of things that are going in there, and we just don't have time to add any trash in the one we're 
going through. Yeah. Does anyone know how uh, day in the life of Ivan Denisovich got on a reading list? <laughs> I assigned that, and I got seven copies of it from my students, and then I read it. Thank God I read it before. It has F bombs on every page. Well, I know that one. I know that one was in the uh, the Veritas reading list uh, as well. I know it was in that one. It's not on our reading list, but it's on there. Uh, they also had Suetonius uh, on their reading list, and I read Suetonius and went, "Okay, all they need to know is that." These Caesars were very vile and disgusting people. They don't need to read about the perverted things they did with children and animals. Yeah. It's not necessary for them to read that. The uh, the Sparks Notes version is a nice overview, chapter by chapter, of Ivan Dmitrievich, and it's sanitized for the children's protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, there's so many good books out there that you can skip the ones that you don't necessarily yeah. care for. Well, I'm warning people. That's, that's not, not a good Not one. inappropriate yeah. even in my school. I All think right. it would be interesting to have, we could add a page to the CCLE site of landmines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, from this publisher, this book is recommended. Here's our counter proposal. Here's. Uh, well, Veritas has Suetonius in its seventh grade one. Yeah. Why would you want a seventh grader to read those things? I don't think there's any need for a, a you know late high schooler to read it. I think our high schoolers have been properly prepared that they could handle it, but I don't see any reason to, other than to just tell them that they were vile and did disgusting things. The flames of Rome by Paul Meyer. Yeah, that they would get more age appropriate. Yes. Get some of those things in there, but. Yeah, some of the some of the things that are in there. That's um, we we followed the rough structure uh, of doing them chronologically. So we do ancient in year one, which is basically from creation starting with Genesis. We go through just before the birth of Christ in the first year, and then we go from there to the Reformation in the second year, uh, and then we go from the Reformation more to the modern era with a heavy emphasis on British and American authors. Uh, in the third year, and then the fourth year is primarily readings that deal with uh, government, um, uh, economics, um, <coughs> apologetics, those types of things are primarily in that year. So uh, that's kind of how we do ours. Um, omnibus, too, is that part of your curriculum? Is well, what I did is I picked and chose from all six of the omnibus things. Mm -hmm. I took things, so like in year one, we're primarily doing one and four. Okay. Stuff from primarily from one and four, primarily books from two and five in the second year, and then <coughs> um, so that's that's roughly how we were doing that. Uh, some of the things, you know, I dumped some of the books because some of the books uh, there there's there's sequen sequencing doesn't always make sense to me uh, because they put some books that are incredibly difficult to read, and then they throw in some books that are ridiculously easy that should have been done in sixth grade. Do you have like a reading list for your Mm -hmm. that you could send to me? Yeah, yeah, it's on the web page too. Yeah, we have okay. pages and stuff like that. Okay, mm -hmm. here. I, uh, I'm the librarian for uh, Grace Lutheran and uh, Brenner. Oh, okay. And yeah. we just started yeah, high yeah. school this year. We have one student. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing it through Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. And so, but I want to kind of beef up the library so that we have yeah. a better selection of the kind of books that I actually want them to read. Mm -hmm. I, I've been working on it slowly, but surely over the past three years. But if I have, a lot of times what I do is I pick and choose from a number of different lists, like the, right, yeah, the, you know, whether it's Memoria or it's Veritas or it's, and I go through and I say that one's good, that one's good, that one. no. Right, it right, and that's kind of what we did. Is it's kind of a combination because I've got a couple books that aren't in the Veritas list that are in ours. Okay. And I dumped, uh, I dumped a lot of their reformed ones out yeah. of it as well. Uh, At least they're easy to identify. Yeah. 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 So uh, the other, the other list that I use somewhat is um, uh, Adler uh, had put together a really good list More of uh, books, huh? More Morgan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He had done a really good thing with that, and I came across on uh, Amazon, somebody was auctioning off that entire set 
for that, and I bought the entire set for like $130. So I've got in my room the entire deal that goes along with that, and so you know I've, I've pulled excerpts out of uh, some of them to read to the class, some of the ones that we're not covering, because they're just we can't do we can't do all can't books. Do all. You just can't. You just can't. So we haven't done the Peloponnesian War. Uh, I'd like to do more of it. But we haven't read the whole Peloponnesian War. We can't read that and Herodotus and all the other things. There's a finite amount of time that you can read. You can read excerpts. Um, in general, we don't read excerpts in in our school. We used to read the entirety of that. So now, do you do a, anything in Latin? I mean, or do they, is that something? To Latin is taught about? by the Latin teacher primarily. And so anything that's in the original, then he handles by so. Yeah, yeah they, they primarily do that, partly because uh, I did not receive a classical education, so I don't know Latin. <laughs> I mean, so that's, yeah, that's part really, of it. I mean, the, of, the of our generation, really, really do pass. It's our kids that are far better educated than I am. Well, I feel cheated because I think maybe I would have, uh, I would have enjoyed school more. Yeah. Because you know, I was never, when I would ask questions about why to learn something, you know, he, talk, he was talking about uh, in the, the plenary session, we had to do that defense or apology of education to the youth all along there, I was no different. I was one that always asked, why do I have to learn this? Right. And the reason that was usually given was because I'll smack you upside the head if you don't from my dad, or because you need it in order to get your uh, your uh, diploma so that you can go to college, so that you can get your degree, so that you can get a job. Okay, so the material itself is not useful. The piece of paper yeah. is what I need. Okay, so I'll learn things for a test and then forget it five minutes later. So, uh, you know, I feel like I was, I was cheated because I think had I understood how these things were supposed to relate to me, I might have learned it better. I found when I was in college how incredibly stupid I was. I don't know if you came up with that too, but after reading, you know, such small snippets, I started realizing how incredibly undereducated I was. Well, our students uh, take dual credit classes starting the junior year over at the community college. It's about seven minutes away, and they just absolutely wreck the curve over there. They have to be put they outside the curve, or they flunk everyone in class most of the time. Yeah. On that. So they, 